r slash credit. Serious parents of Reddit who decided to cut contact with your children. What's the story? My son's paranoid schizophrenia symptoms are triggered by my presence. As a father I wish with every breath that I could talk to him and hug him, but he's better off without me around. It's the same, whether he's medicated or not. I only wish I could make him understand or feel like he understands why I'm not in his life. Edit. Thank you to everyone who commented, upvoted, gilded, and spared a thought for me and my family. I've frequently been moved by the kindness sometimes shown on Reddit, and I now feel like I've experienced it firsthand. I wanted to take the time to respond generally to some of the comments and questions. Most of all, those who are afflicted as my son is, and those who are in similar situations with their children. Thank you for validating that this dynamic occurs. My wife and I need to work through this because she sees my pulling away from our son as a cop-out. We've had some counseling over the years and I sometimes attend NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, family support meetings. I stay busy in my community, so I can't always make it to a meeting, and it's been a while. So I have resources to discuss this, but I've literally never encountered another family where this dynamic is occurring. Thank you for speaking up and know that you are in my thoughts. I'll share that I did attempt to reach out in a small way to my son a few weeks ago, on his birthday. He's living in a group home now, and my wife went to see him. Knowing that he loves Zaxby's chicken wings, I sent a Zaxby's gift card, and a birthday card. I tried to keep it trigger free. Happy birthday, I hope you enjoy your Zaxby's. Love, Dad. During their subsequent visits, there is one constant that she reports back to me when they discuss where they'll eat. There's one place he won't go, Zaxby's. I don't want to come off all winny, but it's as if I broke Zaxby's for him. I knew that was a risk, but I was trying to see what I could do for him, you know? I'm just glad it wasn't Crystal. He really loves Crystal. For those whose loved ones are nasty to them, I actually remember the days my son was nasty to me as good ones. At least we were together, and we had the occasional laugh or other positive interaction. I hope that you can consider accepting that as a cost of being with someone who might not be able to help themselves. Don't take it on board. Maintain your emotional boundaries. Change the subject. I know it's very difficult. Anyway, no, I've not turned away from him because he is mean to me, but rather that my presence seems to trigger self-destructive behaviors. For instance he's burned through several group home situations each one within days of my attempting to reintroduce into his life. It was always the same pattern. He'd get into a situation. He'd do well for a few weeks. The rules of the place would permit him a visitor. My wife and I would visit. His behavior would deteriorate. He'd be put out on the street. His current living situation is lasting longer than any previous one and I ascribe that to my absence. For those asking if I might have abused him, the answer is no, but I will share that his turn against me was so shocking and disorienting to us all that my own wife asked me the same thing. And yes, I was not always a paragon of patience and understanding during this time. We did lash out physically at each other, but it was situational and rare. I regard these incidents as a symptom, rather than a cause, of the reality as I understand it now. His mother and I made a lot of the usual mistakes parents make, and when I took parenting classes I was horrified at the damage I might have done to him due to those mistakes. I think those mistakes could have engendered a lack of independence and a sense of entitlement in him, but I do not regard them as a cause of his severe mental illness. I'm open to trying to find a life configuration that permits me to be a positive influence in his life. I haven't found one yet. And, as a person who tries to live and laugh and love, I want to share that the people suggesting I put on a disguise and interact with my paranoid schizophrenic son sent my mind into its always sunny territory. Laughter through tears, anyone. One more thing here, as an afterthought, reading all this, you'd never know that my wife and I also have a daughter. She's 18, about to head to university. She has told me, to my unending pain, that she has often felt like an afterthought. Even when he's out of the home, our son can suck all the air out of the room with just a mention of his name. I became conscious of this dynamic only about 10 years ago, during a brief respite from our son's rapidly declining behaviors, and we try to remain conscious of that, but that's just another side to this, that some of y'all might benefit from hearing about. Thank you all.
you've restored some of my faith and taught me a lot. My stepson is a mess, my husband and his ex-wife divorced when SS was 18 months old and mom had done whatever she could to cut dad completely out of his life until SS was 8 when she showed up at our door with SS in tow and his bags. She said she couldn't handle him anymore, all he would do was fight with his siblings, so if we didn't take him then she was going to take him to the children's home. Of course my husband was excited to finally spend time with his son and he would get to bond with his little half brother who was 4 at the time and stepsister who was 10. It became apparent very quickly that he had been fed lie after lie about his dad he would gleefully share very detailed stories about the abuse that he remembered that he and his mom suffered at the hands of my husband. SS was in therapy but really started escalating dangerous behaviors my daughter would wake up in the middle of the night with him standing over her saying next time you'll never wake up. So we put a lock on her door which he broke through with ease. We put a deadbolt on her door he broke the door frame trying to get to her. His little brother would walk by and he would kick him as hard as he could. He bit him until he would draw blood. The last straw for me was when he barricaded himself in his room with his little brother. I could hear my son screaming when I finally got in my SS was molesting him. That for me was the last straw. He needed more help than what his therapist or we could do for him. The next day child services was contacted and he was removed from our home. A few weeks later CPS gave us pages and pages of psychological evaluations that his mom had on him. Pages of her blaming dad for each of his issues, lies that he had beaten molested him, although there were statements from doctors that had clearly outlined that mom and her family had some seriously undiagnosed mental issues. There was so much information that would have been helpful before he came to live with us. I would never tell my husband that he cannot see his son, but his son is never allowed around my children I made that promise to them both. And I hate that my husband is in the middle, but for our safety I've cut off any contact with my stepson. So I had my son early, around 17. The girl I had him with moved away before I met him. Five years later I get sued for child support, so I paid and decided to try to take some care of this child. Fast forward to him in high school, I never got to spend more than the summers with him due to him living so far away, and the fact that his mom is a bitch anyway I find out that he hasn't been to school in literally years, so much so that by almost 20, he hadn't graduated grade 9. Things go wrong in my life, to my ex-wife, decides to leave me for some woman, and my son shows up at my doorstep saying that his mom kicked him out. I told him that he had to go to school if he's going to live with me. He finally agrees and I start finding out how terrible his mom did for him in school. He was labeled as severely learning disabled, schizophrenic, and was prescribed antipsychotics which I'd never seen him take. It turns out he told his mom that he was seeing things and after she took him to every doctor in the city, the first few couldn't find anything wrong with him. She finally got a few diagnoses. I took him to my doctors and find out that he was playing along so that the school would give him an easier time I get the school to give him a chance and he finally starts on as English math, etc. And, to everyone, except me, surprise, he passes with high grades so much so that he is accepted into college with a minimal of effort. Figuring he turned over a new leaf, I decide to buy him a car put a couple of months rent down on his own apartment and give him a couple thousand dollars to help with tuition, not to mention that I bought him a laptop, a bunch of dishes, pots, and pans etc. He looked so proud when he moved in and I remember beaming all the way home after helping him move in the week before school starts. I see him for the next couple of weekend to ensure that he is transitioning to his new place well enough, although he seemed a bit lonely at times. He seemed to be adjusting quite well. Two weeks after school starts, I get a call from the school telling me that my refund was processed. I immediately call my son, much to my surprise his cell phone was cut off. Even though I'm the one who pays for it, I go to his apartment to see if everything is okay and the superintendent told me he moved out last week. I haven't heard from him since, but through the grapevine I found out that a friend of his won a legal battle and got a few hundred thousand dollars, so they pulled their money to become big time drug dealers. I have no idea where he is now, I haven't heard from him, his mom hasn't, his grandparents haven't, nobody has. 
My husband's oldest daughter is not part of our lives at this point. We basically discovered that everything she ever said was a lie. She got involved with a younger guy that's a real asshole. He's horrible to her and her daughters. She called the police on him, kicked him out, said she was never going to see him again. We made it clear that he would not be allowed around us or the other kids for any reason. She says she's pregnant. His dad blasts them on Facebook for being idiots, pointing out what an irresponsible mother she already is. She goes on a rant about how she pays her bills and takes care of her girls. The whole time, I'm thinking bitch, I paid your gas, so it wouldn't get shut off. I'm apparently the only one attempting to feed your kids something other than marshmallows, and I'm the only one that ever expects them to behave. Not to mention the million times I've cleaned caked on dirt from their feet or necks because she won't bathe them properly. She had a miscarriage the next day, wanted some kind of sympathy, even though she had been hoping for a miscarriage until her bio mom convinced her that she needed another grandbaby. Anyway, a day or two later she asks for a ride. I ask who slash when slash where. She wants us to give abusive ex that has already moved back in with her a ride to the store. Fuck no. Reminded her that we are not doing anything for him ever. Pointed out that it's pretty disrespectful of our wishes to try to force him on us. She threw a tantrum. He threw a tantrum. Told us get over it or don't speak to her and the grandbabies again. I told her I'm not having that abusive piece of shit around her siblings. She can either respect that or move on without us. She chose the abuser. We've ran into them driving around town a few times. The guy will literally hang out the window of the car screaming, making faces, and flipping us off every time. They act like they are still 12. I miss my grandchildren, but I don't miss their mother. Edit, a little more info. My grandchildren have a father that's working on getting them. It'll take time, but he knows he has our full support. Grandparents do not and should not automatically have rights. Without substantial evidence of abuse or neglect, family services will not do anything. They can't remove children from a home just because grandma said so. And when it comes right down to it, money greases the wheels and the dad's the only one with money to spare. I gave my son up for adoption at birth. I was broke jobless homeless, sort of, I had a room at the worst hotel in town, was about to kick his dad out, and even if I could find a job I had no one that would watch my then 18 mth old and a newborn while I worked. I know, a lot of y'all will rag on me for even being pregnant. We had a great apartment, a happy relationship, and great jobs when we decided to try for another baby. Things went south really really fast, and I couldn't think of anything else I could do for my kids than to give the baby to parents that could take care of him, the way he deserved straight from the start and fight like hell to claw my way out of the hole I was in, and give my other kid a better life too. So I did it, I gave him up to wonderful, amazing people. Six weeks later I was cleared to work, and miraculously got a job. Saved for a year and moved myself, my toddler, and my kid's dad out of that godforsaken town. Years and years later I'm doing very well, I stuck to my promise that it would be worth it. In a hoe, I haven't talked to him. I got letters from his mom for a while, always with pictures, but not anymore. I never responded to them or wrote him. They had been burned in the past by birth moms shopping around and trying to sell their babies, and I've heard horror stories about adopters contacting their birth parents and discovering they were utter crap and they were better off without knowing what happened to their birth parents. I was worried that me contacting them would complicate his life in ways he didn't need. They are wonderful people. I would rather live in pain, heartbreak, and uncertainty than intrude in their happiness. I want to know him more than anything in the world, but if he doesn't, I'll stay right here, away, quietly making good on my promise to him that it would be right and worth it, and that I would never again be in that spot. He will be 15 now. Matthew, if you are reading this, I love you. Forever and always, my baby you'll be. Eater, huge thank you to everyone who commented. I finally had the courage today to call the law offices that handled his adoption. They were very kind, I'm fortunate that they picked a very pro-birthman practice. The one who personally handles my cases out today and Monday, but he took my name and number and assured me that I would get a call from the Piralagal on Tuesday so she could get all the information she needs to try to set this up. I'm so hopeful right now. Thank you, people of Reddit.
Because of all of your kindness I might actually get to meet him soon. Update. They said no. <laughs> Colon open bracket. This is a difficult thing for me. I'm not the ideal father in this situation. I know it. All I can say is that this whole thing weighs heavily on me. I have two girls. Their throwaway names are Jane and Janet. They have two mothers, Susan and Roxanne respectively. I was 19 years old when my first daughter, Jane was born. Her mother, Susan decided to leave me when she was about 2 years of age. She wasn't in it anymore and found what she was looking for in the arms of a narcissistic coke dealer, for a while anyways. Later this would turn to severe alcoholism, depression, etc. Lifelong struggle kind of thing. My eldest daughter has turned into a remarkable young lady, but like anyone, has her own things she deals with. Just shy of three years later, my second daughter, Janet was born to a different mother, Roxon. We dated but were not really serious, one of those types of things. This was very difficult for me as I was a 22 year old, already paying child support, and was financially and emotionally stunted. Yes, we were careful, thanks. I wasn't ready to deal with this again and that's on me. I wish I had a better mind at the time, but I had almost no contact with my second daughter until she was 7 years of age. I don't know. I just was avoiding dealing with the fact that I was single father w slash 2 children and 2 mothers. It was something that for me was very difficult to deal with. Her mother, Roxon is a decent person with no direction in life. Loves tattoos, never could hold a job, is a great conversationalist, and is obsessed with the alternative lifestyle. Now, a little background for those who aren't in this kind of thing. I've always paid my child support, but the effect of this on a young person financially is devastating. I'm 40 and just now making enough to support myself and my family. I work in it, and was fortunate enough to have a skill in an emerging industry, 1990 era. If you choose this path in life, you work and give up a large portion of yourself and your lifestyle because of the choices you've made. I could not attend college as I had no money and no time. I tried, on three separate occasions, to attend a local community college. I eventually couldn't keep up with working two jobs and attending school and raising my daughter by myself. We had 50% shared custody agreed between Susan and I, never by a court. Around the 7 year mark, 10 year mark for my eldest, I made the commitment that I would be involved if my youngest was interested. I had come to my senses that I was being a selfish asshole of a father and I didn't want to be that person anymore. Her mother thought it would be a good thing for everyone. She was starting to hold down a job, finally and what single mom can't use a break? It was great. I had both the girls over to my home on weekends and we cooked together, watched TV, went to parks, etc. I really enjoyed this time with them and remember it very fondly. Just me and the young ladies that made me a special person. I lived in the Midwest during all this and eventually began to date a woman from the South who I've known for a very long time. We knew each other as children and have been around each other from time to time our entire lives. This led to long distance dating and eventually, marriage, 10 years almost. She wanted to move to where I was at, but was unable to due to the legal system involving her own children. I made the decision to move south and be with my wife. This was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, as it meant that I wouldn't be around the girls on a regular basis. My girls are 12 and 9 at this point. I moved and found work fairly quickly in the it world. I paid my child support regularly and caught up on the move gap over the course of 6 months. I began to plan to have my girls come visit and they did from time to time. Jane visited more frequently than Janet as her mother had issues with alcoholism and she wanted to be away from it and Susan would also help with the travel expenses involved. I also would visit from time to time and stay with a couple of friends to reduce the expenses involved. Good pals are good pals and it helped me see my kids. Janet would come to visit during the summers, and this part is where things started happening. She was to stay with us for a month during the summer as was agreed upon. Once she came to visit, her mother would constantly be on the phone with her, for hours. There was rarely a gap in their constant communication. I expressed to Roxon that this was the time that we have with Janet, and we would like to spend it with her. This was met with she isn't comfortable in the house and misses home. This continued on a daily basis. 
I asked my daughter if she was nervous about being with us down here, and she said yes, I miss my mom. I understand that, eventually, her mother had a friend drive down with her and picked her up two weeks into the visit. Maybe a month was too long for an initial start? I don't know. Next year, we did the same thing. Had both girls down for the summer and agreed that the visit would be three weeks. Once again, my eldest was excited to be here and my youngest couldn't get off the phone with her mother. Once again, I expressed that we would like to have the time with her, that we are allowed and once again, the visit was cut short, this time, one week after she had arrived. Frustrating. Eventually, my Jane moved in with us and attended her first two years of high school. She wanted to be with us for a while, to get away from the things at home. Again Susan had a very bad alcohol problem, and I mean bad. Jane wasn't happy in the home she'd said and wanted a fresh start going into high school. My wife and I agreed and she moved in with us. During her sophomore year, Jane came to me one night and said dad, Janet is telling people that you molested her. I was absolutely floored. The first thing I remember was confusion, anger, panic. I called but Janet refused to talk to me, though she did say that she didn't want to be my daughter and that she hated me. I tried contacting Roxanne and her response was I'm not sure what's going on. As Janet would only talk to Jane once in a while now, slowly Jane got a story out of her. When she would come visit, she was uncomfortable in the house and wasn't comfortable with any physical affection. Yes, I'm aware of the signs, but I'm also the one being accused. I attempted over the next 6 to 8 months to make contact with Roxanne or Janet, but was met with she isn't ready kind of statements. I recall asking directly do you really believe that I'm capable of something like this? Answer no, but I don't know what to think. Plainly, Janet just didn't seem to want contact. Y'all, this changed me. I went into depression, withdrew from my family and still feel affected on a daily basis. I'm a mess sometimes. My mind is confused, I have panic episodes, difficult time focusing on tasks, I had frequent anger outbursts, the list goes on. Three years pass. One day, Roxanne calls and I asked about Janet, she's doing good, keeping herself together, she's not, she's a mess. A minute, I know how to use social media, but she's cut contact with me. Eventually, I made contact with Janet over text messages. She expresses to me that she's sorry and that she didn't feel that she was molested and wants to be a part of my life and that she is glad I didn't give up on her and wants to try harder and loves me. I'm glad but can see that there is some serious emotional issues with this child. I also cannot help but feel that I'm responsible for this due to my uninvolvement when she was young. My bed takes some serious weight. Janet is 17 now. I've sent birthday and Christmas wishes and all that kind of thing and expressed that I care for her and would love to see her, but it is completely one-sided. She never calls nor makes attempts at communication. I see her on social media frequently with just the trashiest things, talking about sex, drugs, that sort of thing. She's obsessed with her appearance and how men perceive her. Yeah I know. I gave up trying to communicate with her this year in January. The last thing I said to her was that I loved her. I think she is a wonderful young lady and I'm here for her if she ever wants to talk or come visit. I would welcome her with open arms. I haven't heard a word back, but I watch from a distance and sometimes I'm disgusted from the window from which I have to watch her. I'm afraid that she is turning into a very trashy young lady and it's like watching something you know you can't affect. We make our own beds and lie in them. I wish I had been a better father to her. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe the channel.